All right, uh, I think we're going to start because I think they might get a class right now. Anyway, uh, so I'm very happy to introduce Rob for now. He is currently at the American Museum of Natural History. I've actually known Rob for quite a while. He was on my thesis committee, <laughs> and I consider him like uh, a friend, a uh, very dear friend. So he got his Bachelor of Arts from the University of Chicago. I don't know what your name is. It was the 70s. I don't think I had it. He actually wanted to be a social worker. It was worker. news to me that I went to the University of Chicago. Okay. So he actually started out wanting to be a social worker. Then he wanted to work with whales, I think. Um, but he actually hang out in the Field Museum of Natural History in Chicago a lot. And he did a lot of his undergraduate research projects there. And he then um, went on to graduate school in Washington University in St. Louis under Alan Templeton, that's your thesis advisor. And he was studying Hawaiian fruit fly evolution using molecular genetics. One of the first people who actually started doing that. Um, so his work caught the attention of Alan Wilson, who's in UC Berkeley. Um, many considered to be the father of modern molecular evolution. And he, after that, he did another postdoc with Dan Hart in Washington University. He, the two postdocs combined were actually just two years. And my own postdocs was actually six years long. So <laughs> I guess times have changed. Um, then he moved to Yale um, for his first position as an assistant professor. I guess Yale wasn't what he wanted. <laughs> and then he yeah. moved to the American Museum of Natural History as an assistant curator where he stayed until today. So now he's a curator. He also had a joint position in New York, New York University, Columbia University, City University of New York. So he teach in all these places. That's why I actually met him, because I was at NYU when he was teaching there. Um, he is on the editorial boards for many well-regarded journals over the years, and still is. He's actually a prolific author of hundreds of journals in his field, as well as a lot of interesting books. One of the most favorite ones of mine is actually um, The Science of Jurassic Park in the Lost World, which I'm very proud to say I have an autograph copy of. <laughs> And I think he's actually now writing, he just told me he's writing a book on wine, which I also want an autograph copy of. So. <laughs> All right, he's, he's raw. Yeah, and that, that uh, the Science of Jurassic Park book is available on, on the web for like 50 cents. So. <laughs> <laughs> um, I, I love coming to entomology departments as I was talking with Phil. And uh, we went into the lab and talked to his students, and we stood in front of a picture of an ant penis for 15 minutes and talked about the ant penis. So it, it's really a lot of fun to come to an <laughs> and, and then you give a lecture in a room with a, with a, a museum uh, exhibit uh, hanging from the ceiling. So it's really, really great to be here. And, and thanks uh, to Joanna for asking me. Um, uh, I'm not going to talk too much about insects, though. So those of you who thought I was going to talk about insects can get up and leave, but what I'm, what I'm going to talk about is mostly about the tree of life, and it really doesn't matter what you're talking about when you talk about the tree of life, but it does matter if you're talking about the tree of life being dead, um, then you're pretty much going to want to talk about bacteria uh, and archaea. Uh, so I'm going to talk a little bit about that. Um, of course, the, the whole idea of, of uh, life being represented by a tree comes comes pre-Darwin, really, but Darwin was the one who pretty much solidified it as a part of modern evolutionary biology um, with his great tree of life metaphor and on the origin of species. If you look through the or on the origin of species, you'll find some just beautiful passages uh, with respect to his uh, thinking that, that the tree, that trees were great metaphors for uh, how life evolved on this planet. And through his writing, his notebooks, which you see down on the bottom right, uh, his famous I think figure, he articulated why thinking in, in a, a tree way is a very uh, good way to think about, about life on the planet. And through his writings to other, other uh, to his colleagues, such as this quote from, J, from a letter uh, to J.D. Hooker in 1858, just before he published On the Origin, um, he says, uh, I'll do something until when I discuss the principle of divergence, which along with natural selection is a keystone in my book. And that great, very great confidence it is sound. And this principle of divergence 
he thinks is just as equally as important as natural selection and you know, this principle of divergence essentially is let's think about things in, in the context of trees. And then let's flash forward about 140, 150 years and we see that our, our view of, of, of the tree of life is something like this. Um, and this is before we started to sequence a lot of genomes. And then our view of the tree of life turns into this. And you probably have seen this figure uh, all over the place. Um, and, and the reason for this, of course, is that um, microbes like to uh, toss things around via transduction, conjugation, or transformation. And each of these mechanisms causes a mix-up in, in how you interpret the trees that you're, that you're interested in. So for instance, if, if um, you think the, the phylogeny is three with four, then two, then one, well, hor a horizontal transfer or, or um, a horizontal gene transfer, HGT, which is what I'm going to probably call it throughout the rest of the talk, will alter the tree topology to give you something that's, that's not the quote-unquote true tree. Uh, and also, at, at another level, um, we have what's called the gene tree species tree problem, and it's kind of related to HGT, but there are other reasons for uh, uh, the gene tree species tree problem, which are related to uh, in incomplete lineage sorting. Uh, and this causes a, a similar problem in interpreting trees and, in, 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 I guess, trusting the information that you get from, from uh, 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 information where you're going to that you're going to use to build a tree, and and these two problems have become very very acute as a result of genome sequencing. Back when back when uh, um, I was a postdoc at, at Berkeley, um, we didn't have this problem. We didn't think about this problem. This problem was just was was nowhere in anybody's in anybody's mind. And only through genome sequencing sequencing did these problems really come to the fore. So there's a lot of talk in, in the literature. Uh, especially from for Doolittle's group about um, the uh, a lack of support for tree thinking. In other words, the bifurcating history of life doesn't work in in, in some groups and in others. Um, uh, th th this is was a particular study that uh, was done that showed uh, that a genome level analysis of, of of a group of organisms, of several groups of organisms, uh, resulted in uh, incongruent trees from individual genes and. Uh, my group actually uh, uh, has done some work similar to this. This is the, a, a group of Pastoralaceae that we worked on. Um, and uh, from whole genomes, uh, constructed a phylogenetic matrix and then did phylogenetic analysis on them. And the, the striking result that we got here is that um, uh, the, the, um, in, the, in the top graph is all the genes in the genome, whether or not they're represented by all the taxa. Uh, so there's some incomplete taxon representation for some of the genes. But uh, the number of genes is on the y-axis, and the number of nodes that the tree for that particular gene agrees with the, the uh, um, total evidence tree it is shown on the x-axis. And it turns out that no single gene actually recovers the total evidence tree out of the out of the 2,000 or so genes that were in this analysis. And on the bottom are the 633 genes that are present in all 14 taxa in the analysis. And in this case also, no single gene recovers the total evidence or the concatenated <coughs> hypothesis. But if you look at the hypothesis that you get from concatenating, the, the uh, result is that you get strong, strong inference for a, a specific topology uh, and, and that is the concatenated topology. In essence, every, not in essence, but in fact, every node in this tree has 100% bootstrap jackknife and uh, posteriors, phasing posteriors uh, equal to 1.0. But, so now you go back to, to the, um, uh, um, the, the thinking that this, that this tree thinking doesn't work uh, in yet another paper and they say in this paper, to sum up our arguments uh, thus far in a single sentence, the belief in, in the existence of a universal tree of life, inclusive of prokaryotes, is stronger than the evidence from genomes to support it. And uh, um, in fact, we should, the, these uh, researchers say that we should be thinking about the tree of life as a, as a comb of life. And uh, um, I use the, the, a sentence from a review 
uh, of a paper that I was a co-author on to, to uh, uh, express this sentiment. Um, recently, whole genome prokaryotic and tree of life phylogenies has been viewed as a useless and scrutable endeavor, basically because that's the endeavor that I tried to get published. And, and, uh, and this is because of the prevalence of horizontal gene transfer. And it's safer to assume a, a comb-like topology of life. Um, and this safe topo topology would be a soft polytomy, that is, one where we have a lack of resolution of deep nodes in the tree. Now, can we really think about the tree of life this way? And so what, what I want to do is try to show you some ways that we've tried to uh, think about the tree of life and, and to try to um, uh, come up with arguments for the tree of life. Um, and in this, in this first study I want to show you, uh, what we did here is we uh, used uh, different E-value cutoffs. And those of you who do a lot of genomics will know what an E-value is. It's essentially a criterion that you use for establishing enough similarity to call something the same. Um, and in this case, we constructed uh, matrices at, at nine, uh, at actually, in the, in the slides I'm going to show you, at many different E-values. And then what we do is we identify all the gene families with more than one gain on the optimal tree. So we can take the, the optimal tree and we can map each, the presence and absence of each gene that in, in, in a, a particular gene family onto that tree. And then what we can do is identify gene families with more than one gain on the tree uh, and with multiple zero to one changes. And we call these horizontal gene transfers. And then we can test if the exclusion of HGT, uh, HGTFs um, um, uh, improves phylogenetic resolution or consistency by removing the misleading, the quote unquote misleading homoplastic phylogenetic signal that are in HDT genes. So it's just a process of identifying genes that we, that are HDT on the result, uh, as a result of looking at their reconstruction on a phylogenetic tree uh, and then taking that category of genes, pulling them out and doing an analysis to see what happens. And so the, the, this is just a couple, these are just a couple of examples to show you how we scored whether or not a gene was HGT. Um, in the top uh, figure, um, the reconstruction is very, very simple. There are two zero to one transformations in that tree. That, therefore, is what we would call an HGT. Uh, in the bottom figure, uh, there, uh, it, there are uh, different ways to reconstruct this character on this tree, but in essence, it boils down to two one to zero changes and two zero to one changes. And again, we count one HGT, and this gene family would be counted as having an HGT in it. And the really nice thing about this is that you can actually see disparate patterns, such as in the tree on the bottom, and still count that as a no HGT. So uh, this is, a, I think, a very conservative way of thinking about uh, 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 binning genes as either HGT or as uh, not HGT. And so. If you look at a variety of E-values and you count the total number of genes in an analysis and the total number of non-HGT genes in an analysis, the blue line and the red line is total, and the HGT genes is the green line, you find that about one-seventh or so of the genes uh, it at uh, an E-value of 50 are uh, HGT. <coughs> so the idea here is that if, if like, 50% or 75% were HGT, then we should be afraid, then we should be very afraid. Um, but it, given that it's not an immense number, then this is, is somewhat uh, uh, encouraging that HGT, at least when you use it as a, as a phylogenetic tool, is not overwhelming. And uh, the, the, these uh, figures just uh, summarize the, the uh, uh, percentage and the extent of horizontal gene transfer in different trees, in a, in a combined tree, an amino acid tree, and a presence absence tree, and it never exceeds 7.5%. Uh, and, um, and per gene, it's maybe 17, 18%, as I showed on the previous, previous slide. Rob, what were the organisms again? Uh, this is, I'm sorry, I should have said that. This is a, 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 a whole genome tree from 170 eukaryote and archaeal and bacterial genomes. Uh, that was constructed in uh, 2010. Okay. How do you get a starting tree for that? You. What do you mean? How do you get a starting tree? Well, you're you're mapping transfers, right? Yes. You use the total evidence tree for okay. that tree. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So what happens when you start to pull a horizontal gene transfer out? What happens? 
Well, on the x-axis, I'm showing measures of consistency with respect to the total evidence tree. And on the y-axis is E-value. And just look at the two solid lines at the top. That's, those are the things that we need to look at here. And the combined data have consistency, uh, uh, have a tree consistency consistently 10% better than when you take the HDT out. So when you remove HDT, you're actually removing consistency from the analysis. And then finally, when you remove HDT, what happens if the combined analysis on the left and when you remove the HDT genes, you de-resolve your tree. So the HDT genes are actually providing signal and providing signal for resolution in, in the gene trees and also providing a, 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 a pretty good degree of consistency and at the same time don't seem to be uh, overwhelming in, in uh, uh, HDT genes don't seem to be overwhelming in their number with respect to non-HGT genes. And so what you do is you take the data set and you try to publish it. And that's what we did. And one of the comments that came back from a reviewer that, that caused the paper to be rejected, it was, it should be completely obvious to the authors that if they took the paragraphs from the manuscript, transformed them into lines to mimic genes, and did this to reconstruct a phylogenetic matrix, that they, and then analyze it, that they would get a stru structured phylogenetic trees, and so, okay, let's see. <laughs> and so what we did was we constructed what I call an I think matrix, and so we took on the origin of the species and transformed on the origin of the species into uh, a number of matrices. You can see here the first line is, is um, uh, I can't read it, but it's, it's Darwin, and the beagle is in the first line, et cetera. And so you call this taxon one, two, three, four, uh, you then uh, pull out all the B's and O's and dashes and, and periods and numbers, and then you turn it into FASTA files and you do an alignment and then you <laughs> analyze it. Pretty random, pretty exactly what the reviewer said. And we do this for four tax, eight tax of 15, 20, and 40. And lo and behold, the, the reviewer is right. You do get highly structured trees. These are the trees that you get from on the origin of species. Um, and, uh, using randomized data. So then you scratch your head and you go, God, this guy was right? I can't believe that. So what you do is you go, well, maybe the trees aren't robust. So you look at the, at the first two trees for four and eight taxa, and it turns out that they have bootstrap values, and, that, and, and those bootstrap values are above 50%, between 50 and 65% for the most part. But when you get above that 15, 20, and 40 taxa, you get trees that look like this when you do bootstraps or just nice or even Bayesian analysis with a Wagner uh, WAG model. And I like to call these uh, Vonnegut trees um, from uh, Bre Breakfast of Champions. I don't know if you've ever read Breakfast of Champions, but this, these refer to a specific part of the human anatomy. So given that, given that uh, robustness is an important, um, an important aspect here, you go back and you say, well, wait a minute now. Um, can I come up with some way to think about a tree of life and maybe thinking my way around this, this, this criticism. And so we asked three really simple questions. If, if you put together a massively concatenated matrix, does it give you a resolved tree? And, and we already knew that it did give us a resolved tree, I showed it to you just a second ago. Then you ask, well, is the result robust? Because if it's robust, then there might be something there. And then you have to ask, is the resulting tree biologically meaningful, whatever that means. But I'll try to give you an idea of what that means. So what we did was we constructed, and I should have had this slide earlier to tell you how we, we uh, constructed this matrix. We construct a super matrix where we concatenate the, the presence absence information for each gene, fa gene family with the sequence information for each gene, gene and gene family. This is a matrix with over 7 million characters and about a million phylogenetically informative characters. And then we analyze that and we ask, does it give a massively concatenated matrix? And yes, it does. And then we say, well, is the resulting uh, uh, tree robust? And uh, this is the tree with, with uh, uh, decay indices on it. Uh, and the uh, data for uh, uh, support measures are shown here. The number of the, per the percentage of nodes that have 50% to 75% jackknife or two, and it'd be the same for bootstraps. 75 to 95% jackknife, uh, there are nine trees and 95 to 99 jackknifes are 15 trees. The rest of the nodes in the tree, 74% of the nodes in this 169 node tree 
are 100% jackknife. So yes, there's a great deal of, uh, of support, robust support for this particular hypothesis. And then is the resulting tree biologically meaningful? And it is because if you look at the structure of the tree, the various monophyletic groups in the tree are all uh, retained and, and retained at high ro uh, with high robustness. So this thing passes the three kinds of, of tests that you can, you can have for a, 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 a tree of life over the, the uh, three major domains of life. So thinking about that then, we thought, well, maybe we need to be a little bit more precise about what robustness is. So we, we thought about a, a way of, of analyzing concatenated data that actually allows us to address a lot of the problems that you have with concatenation. And we call this radical, it's the random addition concatenation analysis. And what we do is we, ha we take a, a data set with, uh, let's say, a thousand partitions. And then we take gene one and we make a tree for it and we save it. And then we take gene two and we make a tree for it and we save it. And we do this for all of the genes. Um, and and uh, actually, uh, it's gene one plus gene, gene, gene one to gene 10, we save the tree. Gene 1 to gene 20, we save the tree. Gene 1 to gene 30, we save the tree. So you're actually adding partitions every time you do this. And you build and save the trees, and then you compare <coughs> these to a standard tree, which is the total evidence tree, of course. You could compare it to some other tree if you want, um, but we, we use the total evidence tree. And then what you do is you uh, simply graph the, the consistency of the tree that you get from each of these random concatenated smaller data sets. Uh, uh, on the y-axis and the concatenation size on the x-axis and you see you get a pattern like this. And this is interesting in and of itself, right, but you want to be able to treat this statistically. So what we do is we randomize, uh, we, we do multiple random addition partitions, build and save the trees, uh, and then we get a graph for that and then we can use statistical methods to smooth the curve. And, and what happens with data sets that have high consistency is you get a curve that looks like this, a curve that reaches the um, highest consistence, consistency that it can reach uh, re relatively quickly after a, a, a small number of concatenation events. And if you have a data set that's crappy, you get something that looks like this. And in fact, the middle ground here is, the is what we call the dynamics of concatenation, and we use statistical methods to, to uh, uh, integrate the area under the curve and use this as, a, as an approach to understanding the statistics of congruence amongst the various concatenated partitions. So let's go back to on the origin of species. And, and here are uh, curves for four taxes, six, eight, 10, 15, 20, and 40. And you can see that even, even though these guys are getting resolved trees at four and eight, they're showing this pattern, this dipping pattern uh, uh, that is indicative of a crappy data set. And in fact, if you do this to other books of Darwin, we, we, have, we have way too much time on our hands if you're using that. <laughs> but, but if you do this with other data sets and randomize with other data sets, you in general get that pattern, although um, this one right here is kind of scary. <laughs> anyway, um, you can do this for uh, lo lots of, um, um, you can do this for uh, lots of randomized data sets. And this is just a summary of a lot of the data sets that we've done. With Fortax, it looks like maybe you're going to get a curve that, that says it's a, it's a decent data set. With six, you're starting to get something linear. But with eight, 10, 15, and 20 taxa, you're, you're leaning more toward that, that pattern that says the data set is kind of crappy. And, and if you uh, take real data sets, LAC is a lactobacillus data set that we generated in the lab. And MEGA is that data set that I showed you the, the, um, the uh, massively concatenated data set. And uh, when you do these random addition concatenations for the real data sets on the top two uh, panels, you, you get patterns that are showing this, this, uh, this uh, uh, graph pattern that, that suggests that the data sets are, are structured, whereas if you randomize the um, lactobacillus data set and randomize the mega data set, you start to see patterns that are less than, than uh, um, uh, less than structured. That's for four taxa. This is for eight taxa. This is for fifteen taxa. 
and this is for 20 taxes. So as you increase taxa, there's less and less structure in the randomized data sets and more and more structure in the, in the uh, real data sets. And then you can smooth these and it just looks a little bit, a little bit uh, better as they're smooth. So what I hope you're seeing here is, is that when you get into the nitty gritty of concatenation, um, the, the patterns of concatenation through this uh, radical approach come out uh, uh, much clearer and we're now developing uh, some statistics that, that we can use to assess, uh, say, um, the, the, uh, the, the, the uh, robustness of saying this is a, this is a, a, the LAC curve on the top is a different curve than the LAC random curve on the bottom. Okay, so let's move on to lineage sorting, which is the other kind of uh, bugaboo that we have to worry about. And, and um, at, at the extreme end of the anti-concatenation crop, there is a feeling that HDT destroys tree thinking. And also that um, horizontal, uh, that uh, hybridization and uh, lineage sorting can destroy phylogenetic signal. And, and in essence, this destroys the classical way of thinking about, about uh, trees uh, uh, that, that uh, was started by uh, Charles Darwin. And um, this is, again, the gene tree species uh, tree problem. It's prevalent in the literature. This is a, a, a study from uh, my colleague and friend Jody Hay uh, on the Drosophila pseudobscura group. Uh, it was probably one of the first studies to show that nuclear genes would give you uh, different patterns, uh, uh, different nuclear genes would give you different patterns. In other words, would, would show some lineage sorting problems. This is a study uh, um, done by uh, uh, Dan Pollard and uh, Mike Eisen uh, showing, uh, th this is the Drosophila uh, data set showing widespread discordance of genes uh, and, the, and attributing this to incomplete lineage sorting. This is a study that was done with uh, human chimpanzee and orangutan the primates are a big, a big subject, uh, uh, and uh, in this case, uh, lineage sorting is claimed as a problem with, with um, uh, uh, interpreting the phylogeny of, of primates. Um, this is a study from uh, the house mouse genome showing uh, the uh, fine scale phylogenetic discordance across the house mouse genome, and in this figure, the three trees for uh, Castanium, mus Musculus, and uh, Domesticus uh, are shown in red, green, and blue, and the regions of, of a particular chromosome that, are, that have genes in them that agree with the red gene, green gene, and blue gene are marked on the, on the slide here. And this indicates a widespread um, problem with, with the discordance of genes. And then uh, there's this study from uh, Anthony Rokas in Sean Carroll's lab showing uh, incongruence in molecular phylogenies, and while they didn't claim this was lineage sorting that could very easily have claimed it was lineage sorting. And this is the problem with, with uh, uh, the Rokas et al. study. This is the problem they were looking at. The tree on the left is a highly, is a, is a completely resolved, very robust tree that they get from concatenation. And, and the, tree on the, the tree on the right shows where one particular node disagreed at a high frequency with, with the uh, concatenation tree. And that's, the, that's a tree where you put scud and spay together as sister taxa, rather than uh, having them uh, um, as uh, uh, grading into each other into the top three taxa. And this, this again, could be construed as, as lineage sorting. But in a study done by John Gatesy down at, at Riverside, he pointed out that uh, this, this tree that, that was the subject of the, of the Rokas et al. The, the Rokas et al. study um, has uh, various points where it can be rooted, and those are numbered in the circles. And when you root the tree, the, the network at the top, in these circles, you get the trees at the bottom. And it turns out that of the seven ways you can root this, this network, and it's a solid network, um, five of them give you that anomalous scud with spay, uh, uh, a sister parent, and only two of them give you some other, other uh, kind of a, of a um, of an arrangement. And then one of the most ridiculous figures I've ever seen in a, in a paper from John Gates, I told him he would never get this published because it's just the same tree written 106 different times for each of the 106 <laughs> genes. Um, but the point is that uh, you get 106 when you remove, when you remove the outgroups, 
and you remove the potential for rooting, you generate the same tree. They're, they're entirely congruent, all 106 genes. So the incongruence goes away. And in fact, what John showed was that the length of the root to the op, of the op group to the in group is critical in how bad the analysis is. And this, this top figure, uh, the, the box around the figure isn't, isn't a, a border around the figure, it's actually the root of, of one, of the, one of the tags that, that they use to root the end group. Um, and in, in, indeed, if you look at the, the root problem in the Drosophila data set, it's pretty much the same. It's a, it's a really long, long root. So what I wanted to do now is talk about uh, how random rooting um, it, it get, oftentimes gets conflated with lineage sorting. And in, in essence, what we did was we constructed uh, six or six different data sets. Th these are two. Uh, this is the yeast data set with, with several ta outgroup taps added. Um, and this is the Drosophila data set with, with um, uh, insect ta other non dipterine insect taxa added and some uh, dipterine uh, taxa added. This, uh, the tree on the left is the primate data set, and the tree on the right is the mouse data set. And you'll notice above this, the tax there are numbers, and those numbers indicate outgroups that get further and further away from the end group. So one is SCAS, which is the closest in outgroup to the, the in group that was in the, the uh, uh, Rokas et al. study. And Ananasi is one, which is the closest outgroup to the in group that was used in the Pollard et al. study. And so what you, what, you do, what you can do is you can do these analysis with both parsimony and likelihood. And I use what's called a bad to good ratio. So you have you have a a, a, a a tree that taxonomists accept that's the good tree, and then any tree that's not good is bad. And so so what you can do is you can look at the genetic distance of your outgroups, do separate analysis with with, with each of the different outgroups, and uh, uh, as you uh, can see here, the the slope is positive, meaning that as your outgroup gets closer to your in group. Your bad, your good, to, your bad to good ratio gets smaller and smaller. So as you get your outgroup closer and closer to your in group, you're removing the incongruence. Okay, and and part of the problem, it, the problem doesn't go go away when you use multiple outgroups either. So um, this shows the the problem for uh, the the initial in group uh, sets that the authors the authors set up. Yeah. Did you condition the outgroup as part of the tree, or do you include that in your total data set? The outgroup is, is uh, the, the outgroup is inserted and, and then removed, and then the next outgroup is put in, and then removed, and then the next outgroup is put in, and then removed. So it, it's it, it, it's only a single outgroup that's that's doing this. But like I said, if you include multiple outgroups, the problem doesn't go away. You still get a positive slope, and that's both for parsimony and likelihood. So likelihood doesn't help it go away. So what, what we did when we saw this is we thought, okay, now there are other attacks in these data sets that are, that are maybe better for understanding lineage sorting. So for instance, in this data set, what, what they did to, to show the, the, the uh, what they thought was uh, lineage sorting was they used these two and then this one right here. But now what, what, we, what we're trying to do in the rest of this analysis is look at taxa that are actually even closer, closer together where you might have a better chance of seeing and detecting lineage sorting. And in fact, the tree, on, the tree on the left shows the outgroup system. And when you do this, you actually add some outgroups. So it actually adds a little bit of power. And you, you actually get a little bit closer to the, to the in-group by doing, doing it this way. And when you do that, the regressions look like this. And uh, in fact, um, the one, one interesting thing that you can do with these regressions is you can estimate the, uh, the intercept um, the um, uh, the y-intercept where where uh, the bad to good ratio is is uh, zero, and when you do that um, for the Drosophila data set, the intercept is 0.016 or one percent for parsimony and one uh, percent for uh, I'm sorry, would be ten percent and sixteen percent for Drosophila uh, five. Uh, um, uh, it'd be 1.6 percent and 1.0 percent, 5.4 percent for eight, 14.5 percent for maximum likelihood for eight. Yeast, the problem goes away. When you start to bring the outgroups in closer, it totally goes away. 
Uh, but there is one problem, and that's the mouse data set. Um, and, and in this case, uh, half to one third of the, of the genes are uh, bad relative to the good. And, and this, is, this is what the, the, the graph looks like uh, when you uh, um, use the, the, when you graph nucleotide distance to the bad to good ratio. This is strange because what this means is that the genes aren't sorting into, into bins. They're not sorting into, I agree with this tree or I agree with that tree. or I, They are sorting into three different bins, but they're not sorting into one bin in particular. Um, and what this, what this means, if you, if you look at the numbers, there are 370 genes that support the topology on the left, 395 that support the topology in the middle, 354 that support the topology on the right, and the, the orange numbers are those with significant uh, incongruence length differences. Uh, what, this, what, what this means is that you're getting three categories of, of signal coming from, from the genes in this data set. But this makes a lot of sense because these aren't species, these are subspecies, and these are, these are uh, musculus, castaneum, and domesticus have uh, probably uh, 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 been interbreeding up until about 100 years ago. And so this, is th this pattern right here is exactly what you'd expect from, or not exactly what you'd expect, but it's, it, it's, not un, uh, 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 it's not totally off the wall to expect a pattern like this from uh, uh, taxa, quote unquote taxa, that are, are still reticulating with each other. And it, it just, uh, the, in this silly little figure, what, what I'm trying to say is that, you know, as, as uh, uh, populations reticulate with each other, they can maintain a bad to good ratio uh, of, of above, way above zero. But when speciation happens, that bad to good ratio should, should drop. Um, and after a, a, a particular amount of time, that bad to good ratio will start to rise again as a result of homoplasia and other, other kinds of problems. And, and, and you know, the, at this point, you want to really start to think about coalescence and all kinds of other things, but, but um, this is just a, a cartoon to show what I think is going on. So I wanted to conclude by pointing out why a tree of life infected with HGT still bifurcates, and also point out what good is a tree of life infected with HGT. And here, here's just a simple thought experiment. This is a tree with 40 tacks in it, and if you have a horizontal transfer event between the ancestor of, of, uh, of this red group and, and, and it goes to the ancestor of the blue group, group, then your phylogenetic inference for that particular fragment of DNA that was, was transferred will look like this. And those two trees only have a single node different. And, I, and what's happening is everything after the horizontal transfer event is history. And, and everything else in the rest of the tree is still history too. So, that this is, this is why, a very, very simple explanation for why uh, um, a, a, a tree of life infected with HDT really doesn't, uh, doesn't have to suffer um, uh, from the infection. And in fact, from this paper from Abby et al. and PNAS recently, um, they actually used the presence or absence of horizontal, horizontal gene transfer or lateral gene transfer as a character in reconstructing phylogeny, and they found that it was quite a good character to, to uh, use. So wh what good is a tree of life uh, infected with HGT? Well, the, the, the point I want to try to make with this last two, two or three slides is that a tree of life, in, a tree of life that you establish as a, as a null hypothesis, so to speak, can help you a lot understand HGT, I think, a lot better, rather than just going and, and saying, I need to construct a web, um, and, and falling back on the web. A, a, a tree of life that is based on uh, uh, all of the evidence that you have uh, can then tell you lots of, lots of things. And, and I just wanted to show you one example of this. This is an algorithm that a Pervin Arcania, uh, an informatician in my lab, is, has developed. And it's based on a, a, an algorithm that ecologists use, a flocking algorithm. And essentially what it is, it's a bunch of individuals uh, uh, floating around in space and they, they interact with each other whenever they come, come in contact with each other, they make a decision to stay with each other or to repel each other. And there are other decisions that, that you can program into the flocking. But what happens with, with, if you're thinking about this in the context of, of phylogenetics, each of those points now instead of being an individual is actually a gene. And when the genes come into contact, they ask each other, am I congruent with you or am I incongruent with you? And if they're congruent, 
at a certain degree, they'll stick together. And if they're incongruent, they'll repel each other. And so this is just a simulation study that we did to show that it works. This is for four tax and 100 gene partitions. And each gene partition contains 100 characters without gaps or missing data. And we simulate, simulate incongruence by having 50 partitions support one topology and 50 support another, the simplest thing you can do. And this is what happens with the, this is what happens when you do the simulation and you do the flocking. Um, they, they bounce around, they make contact with each other, they make a call as to whether they're congruent or incongruent with each other. You give them enough time, and one of the, one of the, the things that we're still trying to work out about this is what is enough time. Um, but if you give them enough time, they will flock and sort out into the two uh, patterns, or into the two uh, phylogenetic patterns that, that uh, are present in the, in the data set. And so with that in hand, we, we decided to try it with some real data. And this is a data set uh, uh, using 11 uh, Staphylococcus aureus uh, uh, genomes uh, that were selected to uh, highlight a recent introgression of about 500 kilobases of DNA. And so this 500 kilobase of DNA is going to have a different phylogenetic signal or a different evolutionary history than the genomes of these staph aureus. And then what we do is we allow them to, to float around in space, make contact with each other. They'll stick together if their uh, if their um, uh, ILD is meets a certain criterion, and uh, uh, from then we can actually start to think about how these things are, are intergressing and how the the the, the, the uh, uh, incongruence of different genes uh, uh, interact with each other. So there's two kinds of dots here: red and green. The green are the 500 base pair uh, uh, intergressing uh, uh, fragment and the red are the rest of the genes in the genome. So what we're looking at here are 2,000 points, the 2,000 genes in the Staph aureus genome, and the um, uh, 50 or so genes that are part of the uh, uh, element that, that came in uh, horizontally. And what, you, what you're going to see here is that you do get some clusters of red genes, but what's really interesting is that some of the genes that, have, that were, are thought to be uh, uh, part of that um, introgressing piece of DNA are actually embedded within the red genes. So we can actually tease apart the genes that are, are part of the horizontal, horizontal transfer event, and, and you can see the green cluster there too, uh, being chased by the red cluster. <laughs> and, and the green cluster will come back together again soon. But, but uh, uh, what this does is it allows us to, it allows us to uh, think about um, uh, incongruence of large numbers of, of, of uh, genes in, in uh, the genomes of organisms and try to get some idea of, of uh, how incongruence, uh, of how concatenation and incongruence affects an overall phylogenetic hypothesis. And you really can't do that unless you, unless you accept that there is a tree of life, unless you accept that there is a topology that allows you to do this. And then I'd like to uh, just finish by acknowledging <coughs> the people that I worked with and, and I've given Joanna this slide. These are all, all colleagues who, who uh, 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 I've collaborated with, and you can take a look at, at them when you, when you get a chance. So uh, thanks, and, and I hope that uh, what I've done is try to con convince you that the, the demise of the tree of life is, is, uh, um, is not as bad as, as uh, uh, some may have, have wanted us to think, um, and, and that uh, both horizontal gene transfer and uh, lineage sorting can be accommodated Pretty, pretty, uh, uh, pretty, pretty well by taking uh, what Darwin called his great tree of life uh, uh, idea. And uh, I'll answer any questions that you have. What is an intuitive explanation for the red blobs chasing the green blobs? Uh, it's just the way it's just the way that the simulation works. It, it, it's you, the, the way that the points are moving around is through Brownian motion, and I and I think what what it is is that the the green the green blobs kind of like the red one, uh -huh. and they have to they have to get up enough enough momentum to get away from them, and they eventually do get up enough momentum to get away from them. It's, it's something with the way the, pro, the program works, and, and uh, if I knew more about how the program worked, I'd be able to answer that more precisely, but, but I, I'm pretty sure that's what it is. The reason that they're hanging close together is that there is some attraction, but, but then uh, as, they, as, the, as they're allowed to wander a little bit more, they s sort of separate and go off on their own trajectories. Right. Yeah. 
We didn't. Sim simple answer, we didn't. And, and that's why we felt that this was pretty, pretty conservative. We were probably lumping more things in with horizontal gene transfer as horizontal gene transfer events than there were. I mean, there are probably some um, homoplastic events that, as you, as you said, that, that are probably being conflated with, with um, uh, uh, horizontal gene transfer. Although the, the character set that we used is, is gene presence absence and probably little homoplasy there. Would you, would you extend your conclusion Yeah, sure. One thing I didn't get to get a chance to talk about it is is the concept of hidden support. And, and hidden support is 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 um, uh, prevalent in phylogenetic analysis. And what hidden support is 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 you have one data set gives you a tree. You have another data set gives you a tree, and the trees don't look the same. You put them together, and and nodes start to start to start to uh, emerge as a result of putting data sets together. And there's a way to assess hidden support uh, in data sets. And it turns out that hidden support is really quite important in, in, um, in the concatenation process. And in, in the process of giving you these highly, highly resolved, very robust tr trees from concatenated data, um, if everything was random, then you wouldn't, when you did a concatenate, if, if you had that Pastor Lacey da data set where uh, only no, none, no gene gave you the total evidence tree, and it was random. You wouldn't get a highly supported, uh, robust tree after concatenating. It would be, it would be not be very well supported. And so the reason that it is supported is because there's hidden support in combining, in combining things. Um, and to, to expect that that you know a single gene or a cadre of genes will give you uh, a um, a, a uh, supported, a robustly supported, uh, resolved phylogeny by, by themselves. Uh, it, it, it's all about data. It's all about data interaction and, and hidden support. Yeah, John. Is it possible that the gene there is the wrong unit? Absolutely. So you know, if there's yeah, I think that's why the the random addition concatenation stuff works and, and does what it does. Yeah. What we're doing is we're stretching stretching the definition of what a unit is. But you only went, you didn't go below a gene size. Right? No. No. Yeah. Is there something about, um, like, do the HGT genes in the early part of the talk, are they more phylogenetically informative than the non-HGT genes? So other than that one node yeah. in which they conflict with the total evidence tree, um, is there something biological about you know, getting transferred into an organism, a group of organisms, yeah. in which that gene wasn't in, that makes them be pretty informative for those, at least for those first few branches after they're brought in. Yes. And so then, they end up really helping with the solution. That's exactly what hidden support is, I think. It, it, in essence, um, just because you have incongruence at, at a node where an event happens, like an HDT or a messed up lineage sorting event, the information after it is still historical. It's still, still right. going to give you the. the but is it is the HGTDs are are they more informative? We didn't we didn't assess that. Yeah. We, we we didn't assess that. And there's an easy way to do that actually, and that is to go through and look at the look at the um, congruence of HGT genes because there's a way to, to there's a way to um, uh, quantitate. Uh, the congruence of, of a gene at each of the nodes, and, and there's a way to do that, and that's actually a pretty good idea. Anything else? Yeah. I was wondering what your results tell us on, if you could say more on how many outgroups to use, I and mean, you're, you're saying that doesn't really solve the problem yeah, of very long branches. I don't think it's a number of outgroups. I think you just need to get your outgroup as close to your in-group as you possibly can. And then um, if you have like multiple outgroups in a fairly relatively close to you, that doesn't help at all. Like no, it, it 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 actually will exacerbate it. So if you throw an outgroup in, if you have a really close in group and you throw a really far out outgroup in, then that out, far out outgroup is going to exacerbate the random rooting. Um, so you you're you're better off. Um, you know the the party line is use multiple outgroups, right? That's what you're probably taught in your systematics class, but but. What I'm trying to say is, 
no, use an out group that's as close to your in group as you possibly can get. And if you need to add another out group, find something that's even closer than the one that you use. <laughs> because again, by adding that other, you're just asking for random rooting problems. Yeah. If you added a series of graded out groups that were successively more distant, not in any uh, not any, not any big jump. Yeah. Would that not be better than a single effort? Um, I don't think so. I, 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 we've actually tried to look at that, and and actually the single close out group will give you the best B to G ratio. Um, if you add more than more than one out group, if you add, if, if if you add more than one out group and you're adding something that's further away, then that exacerbates the problem. Because you think the other group's just a little bit further away, but it gives you a better resolution of the ancestral states of your nearest that Um That would be that, that that would be a good way to think about it. But what we're seeing is is we're not seeing that. <laughs> Again, get the out group as close as you can to the intervene. Part of the problem is with a lot of studies where you're where you're, where researchers are looking at systems of, of that, that are that are not reticulated but have the propensity for uh, uh, lineage sorting, they're very, very closely related to each other, right? And so and a lot of times the next thing out is pretty far away. And so again, a lot of the studies that, that claim lineage sorting in that context, I think, are, are actually conflating it with random rooting. Now, I'm not, I'm not saying that lineage sorting is not a phenomenon. I'm not saying that horizontal gene transfer are not phenomena that we have to be aware of. I'm just saying that they're not they're not deal breakers. They're not. They're not deal deal killers for what we do as systemists, and they're not deal killers, in, if by any stretch of the imagination, for true black. Mm -hmm. All right. Thank so, thank you, Rob. <laughs>